you glorious gamers out there, welcome to the Players 2 podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts, that really, really helps us out. It does a huge amount for the exposure of the show, and we would be eternally grateful to you. And thank you so much to anyone that's already done that. You are an absolute legend to us. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. With me, as always, Mr. Lewis Camley. How's it going, Lewis? It's going really well, Mark. Uh, yeah, I'm doing well. Um, it's been a super busy week, and I am not sleeping anywhere near enough, but I've had a cup of coffee, so I feel ready to go. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> coffee and no sleep. That's how, that's how work seems to be at the moment for both of us. I think I've worked 30 hours in the past two days or Good something grief. like that. Yeah, it's, it's been... It's not been good. Anyway, video games, what have you been playing? <laughs> um, I've been playing a couple of things this week. Um, I want to mention first um, just another little experimentation with Apple Arcade, which I've been trying out every week uh, since the free trial began. Um, so I picked up a game called Pilgrims, which actually just dropped over the weekend there, I think, onto the service. Yeah, they did a whole bunch of new releases. Yeah, a couple, a couple of new things got added. So this is by a studio called Amanita Design, and I need to admit, I don't really know much about them, but they made games before called uh, Machinarium and Chuchil, which have really interesting art styles and this is kind of what drew me in to try this game it has one of the most unusual kind of hand-drawn art styles i've ever seen in a game it's basically a really simple but quite fun uh, and quite funny sort of point and click adventure set in this kind of weird land where there's like one of your playable characters is like a devil and there's a priest and there's kind of these like almost like old west kind of settlers in, in america literally just picked it up because it looked interesting and it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward to play but really kind of interesting what's going on in it it's much more about playing with the environment and with the things that you can do there so it's kind of based on these cards really fun like I played it for like an hour on the train the other day and like got quite far in it I think and yeah it's just another one of these situations where Apple Arcade particularly with this kind of free model at the moment is really pushing forward some interesting games to players. Um, I've still been playing What the Golf this week as well, which we talked yes, about last yes, week, yes, which, yes. which some of the levels so in good. that, it's, it's, it's absolutely great. So, like, it's I don't so want to spoil it, but some of the games it begins referencing later on absolutely stunned me. I'm about halfway through it and it, it was doing things that I would never have imagined it was going to do. So like that is well worth picking up. But I think that you, the thing about What the Golf is, is that I think that you go into it with zero expectations uh, whatsoever yeah, yeah, like yeah. absolutely none and it just continues to blow you away every <laughs> single step it is fantastically good absolutely and if you're looking at that game i would say and you think oh it's just a golf game it's that's not for me that's not my thing it's not a golf game no it has the mechanics of golf but that is literally about it i mean even later <laughs> on it starts to kind of abandon those as well it's just doing some super interesting things yeah. so so i just wanted to mention pilgrims there like it's not groundbreaking at all but it's interesting that the the subscription model that our, apple are doing who knows if it's got long-term viability whether people will pay 5.99 for it but this game alone i think is about five pounds on steam so you're able to play it entirely for free at the moment and i think that that's really interesting and exciting for gamers to go and try out some new things like i would never ever pick this up and play it otherwise but it's available now so no that's really cool actually so i hadn't heard of this game mm -hmm. at all and in fact the first time i'd heard of it was about <laughs> half an hour ago when you said oh you put that on the list yeah and i was like okay um the art style looks amazing. Yeah. It's all hand drawn. Actually. Yeah, it's kind of like if, if you don't want to look it up or whatever, it's kind of like really grubby looking kind of Quentin Blake illustrations. Yeah. I, oh, do you know what? That's actually really good. It's, it looks like kind of brown era Batman. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Quentin Blake style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it looks it looks very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Check okay. it out, man. Check it very out. Very cool. Um, but Lewis, what else have you been well, playing? Well, beyond that, uh, <laughs> talking of art styles, um, I have finally started playing Link's Awakening on the Switch. Yes. Which we haven't discussed this, mate. No. Talk to me. So I've only played about an hour, hour and a half of it, um, and I spent a fair bit of that time just kind of wandering about the, the first village, like the village you wake up in, just to kind of see what's there. And there's like a little library with all these like hints and stuff. It is just gorgeous. It is it's hard to describe how good it feels to play and how nice it is to be in that space. It feels like quite a relaxing game. Like so far in the bits, it might just be that I'm still really early doors, but it's very forgiving. Like I don't feel under any real peril at all so far. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So, I mean, it might get harder, but yeah, I, like I've been dealing with some enemies, like nothing much is troubling me. So, and the puzzles that I've come across so far are like not especially taxing either. I'm sure it is going to ramp up. I'm about to get to the first major dungeon in the game, but it's so nice. Like the, the mechanics, the, the 
animation of the character in particular the way he attacks things like like the moblins whatever they're called they kind of at the beginning they all throw kind of spears at you and you just kind of like ref, like deflect them with your shield and they kind of like stagger a bit and then you leap forward and attack them with a sword and it's just so satisfying it's, I, I know how simple that sounds but it feels really nice so i've been really enjoying it um the issues that we kind of mentioned when we were talking about the review scores and stuff technical issues none really that i've encountered so far no i've been playing docked well to be honest that was meant to be worse i heard that the problems lay so so that's that's good to hear yeah like there's some very slight like drag particularly when you come in and out of environments so if you exit uh like a hut it like very slightly kind of drops a wee bit like not yeah it just kind of like uh, judders slightly as yeah. it's, it's just catching up with itself but it's like barely noticeable so far at least i mean again there might come a point where there's loads of enemies on screen and lots of stuff i've told happening, that but... there will be parts of the game where there will be lots of bushes uh-huh. that sway in the wind and i think that that's bad yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> so not even the enemies just, everything that i've just done the trees <laughs> <laughs> all, all the areas i've been in so far have been like stacked with wildlife and plant life and stuff like that so nothing has felt problematic so far but yeah it might well happen and i'll definitely mention that in future if it does but for for the little bit of that i've played so far like it's just totally majestic really nice and i should say and i guess i speak for both of us like we've never played this before no nope, we never nope. played the original so i don't have any expectation of what's coming i don't know what the dungeons are going to be like how difficult the puzzles are going to be no this is a serious black spot for us yeah I'd yeah say. like i'd played other zelda games like ocarina of time and like majora's mask N- never never seriously but this one uh, Link's awakening never played it at all my copy is on its way good so stuff yeah, i yeah. am very much hoping to jump into it very soon as well but what i have been playing is ori in the blind forest nice which has now come to nintendo switch this had previously been an Xbox exclusive, but seeing as how Nintendo and Microsoft are best buds mm-hmm. now, after Cuphead, this is now the second mm-hmm. uh, second biggest title to be on the Switch, and it is such a fucking perfect Switch game. It's so good. It's really good. Kind of Metroidvania is a lot less intense than a lot of the other Metroidvanias that I've played recently. A lot of them seems to go much more down the soul's route of being like cripplingly difficult but or he's not really like that so it's a bit more light-hearted than that it's still it's still quite challenging though. Yeah, yeah. like i'm not saying that it's not challenging and i'm only about i'm not hugely far in maybe i'm a couple hours on mm. or something like that I had to fight a couple of bosses wasn't a big deal kind of thing actually the main thing that i'm kind of struggling with more than anything is in precision platforming sections the, the controls of Ori are a bit loose, mm-hmm. like they're not as they're not as tight as like say Celeste, which was like absolutely accurate and to move around as Madeline just felt like perfect. Like she was always there, she was always doing exactly what you wanted it. But Ori sometimes like overruns a platform and things uh, like that. Yeah. And so, not that that's a bad thing necessarily. It's it's just the game just feels differently. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It doesn't feel quite as it doesn't feel as tight. It's as like kind of floaty in the movement and stuff. Then yeah, but I think that's by design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so so I'm, that's not necessarily a critique. It's just something that I had noticed. Um, it seems to be telling like quite a, an interesting, intriguing story initially quite dark story but you can see that it's coming to like a good place it's it's nice it, it seems nice <laughs> okay good yeah no i'm enjoying it i'm enjoying it i, I definitely it's made me look forward to the new one quite a lot yeah as well. yeah definitely all right on to the news then all right and news item number one the nhs in this very country lewis has opened a, a clinic for children who suffer from, quote, gaming addiction. The The staff there will treat kids ages 13 to 25, according to this Guardian article, who have been debilitated by spending countless hours playing games. I'm really not sure what to think of this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, obviously, I think it was last year, the World Health Organization had designated gaming disorder a, a real disorder. However, speaking to Dr. Pete Etchells, he seemed to be less than convinced about the validity of that claim. And he's a smart man, smarter <laughs> man than I am, so I'm inclined to believe him. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about this. Oh, because obviously, if you've got a problem, and video games are addictive, like I'm, I'm not trying to say that they're not. And if you've got an addictive personality and, and you are like quite literally being debilitated by playing video games, then yeah, you should get help yep. like 100%. And please, for God's sake, if you're one of those people, go and seek help. But I'm not really sure this is the way to go about this. Like, I would be very interested to see what sorts of things are said at one of these clinics <laughs> more than anything. Yeah. You know? I think it's probably like 
not a bad thing altogether. So there's a few things there. It's by referral only. So your GP still has to refer you to this clinic. Um, the clinic itself is based in London and it's part of the National Centre for Behavioural Addictions. So it seems like it's part of a broader kind of service about addressing addiction. So what I wonder and hope is it won't be treated as just a place where people go to sort of get over gaming addiction. It's it's supposed to surely be about digging down into the underlying roots of why is it you're becoming addicted to these things? What what are the causes and the reasons for you having this kind of reliance on gaming to get you through the day, I guess? I would hope that it is that. Yeah, but you, you seem skeptical. What are your expectations I, of it being that? I mean... <laughs> who are we to question like behavioral psychologists or whatever like who knows what their approach mm. would be that's that would be my only thing about it but the fact that like as you said the world world health organization has delineated gaming addiction as a serious mental uh, sorry medical condition and so it's good that our national health service is doing something about it because otherwise there might be people left out in the cold but there's still so much there one it's only for the nhs in england as far as we know at the moment maybe wales as well because yeah. their nhs's are fairly linked. So loose you can't be referred <laughs> can't you, be referred you, you cannot be referred i still get emails from that bloody gaming addiction website thing that you did with my email address Did before. I? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yeah, so like we in Scotland wouldn't be referred to it. And also the fact that you have to go through your GP, so it seems to be at least, means that you still have to identify or someone has to identify that you've got this issue and take you to a doctor. Now, given that the age range is 13 to 25, if you're 13, your mum and dad might say you're spending, you know, 23 hours a day playing games, you're going to the doctor, we're going to see about getting something done here. If you're 25... Who's doing that for you? You've still got to recognise that you've got a problem first and that's the first problem for a lot of people is identifying that. Yeah, that's a good that. point, so, That's a good point. So there's still, I mean, it's not a, it's not the end of this problem at all, but I think it's good that the NHS is taking it seriously. We'll see whether or not their response to that is simply just to kind of vilify gaming itself, you know? Well, that's what I hope it is. Mm. And people can be addicted to all sorts of things, but gaming is designed in a lot of ways to be addictive. Segway here, Lewis, on a news item 1.5. <laughs> so kind of on the back of this, and it's amazing that both of these stories came up in the same day, or came to my attention certainly in the same day, but uh, there's a Canadian legal firm pursuing a class action lawsuit against Epic Games for, quote, knowingly creating, quote, a very, very addictive game, e.g. Fortnite. And th- th- this firm have gone so far as to compare this lawsuit to a 2015 lawsuit against tobacco companies in Quebec who weren't properly disclosing how harmful, weren't going far enough to make their customers aware how harmful smoking was. Mm -hmm. And to compare those two things in my mind is absurd, quite (laughs) frankly. Absolutely absurd. To me, it is insane. That comparison does seem a little over the top, and I guess that's what legal firms have to do. The thing about this whole case as well is as you say like games are supposed to be at least semi-addictive they are designed to make you want to come back now. yeah I, imagine imagine that imagine making it a really good game that people want to come back and play again and again yeah you know what i mean well, just it's, just like people want to watch the same tv shows over and, and over again i think that it's so so fucking telling that they've went after the big boy they've went after Fortnite, and they've not went after like candy crush mm-hmm, mm-hmm. do you know what i mean that to me kind of says a lot because Candy Crush, to me, is much, much, much more of the problem. And in actual fact, despite the size of Fortnite and the fact that it does still have loot boxes in them, they're doing away with them. Do you know what I mean? They're they're saying, no, we're not going to have these type of mechanics in Mm -hmm. our games anymore. There will still be microtransactions in them that won't be of the kind of ilk of a traditional... Uh, loot box similar to what Rocket League uh, are doing as well now which yeah, is just yeah. about that, that they are this new uh, blueprint system yeah their system's now been updated and it's now just a blueprint system whereby you see what you're about to buy but that item won't I think as I understand it the item won't move on until either you buy it or like a certain amount of time has passed yeah I think you can kind of take the blueprint into your like inventory so to speak and you can choose at a later point to spend the in-game currency to get the thing if you don't want to do it immediately kind of thing oh is that how it works see I, I, I thought so. I thought that it kind of timed out and then it moved on to something it else it might well also but, time but out but, if it, yeah. but if you didn't buy it like then you didn't have the option of getting something else like that was your blueprint yeah. for like the week so yeah. I, I don't really know how it works I don't want to speculate about mm. that too much and me just be incredibly wrong on the internet <laughs> so I think that that's quite telling because this to me is just a blatant money grab. Mm-hmm. It really is. And a lot of this stuff's kind of heating up because of players like EA, for example, who do have absolutely egregious microtransactions in FIFA and Madden and 
have done for a long time. Do you know what I mean? Uh, people like Activision with Call of Duty, who in the, the last Call of Duty launched with pretty good microtransactions, but by the time the game was out for six months, the, they were absolutely horrific. Do you know what I mean? It's things like that. Mm-hmm. Like, why aren't you going after them? It's totally baseless for me. Like, I, I just... Like, as opposed to, as opposed to like, the gaming addiction stuff, which, as we continue to see, again, loot boxes and similar, quote, gambling mechanics mm-hmm. uh, in games. Like, I, I do think that there could potentially be a need for that, although I am sceptical about what the treatment for that... I mean, the treatment for addiction, historically, mm. is pretty shit. Yeah. So I don't really know why this would be any yeah, better, exactly, quite frankly. Yeah. But given the benefit of the doubt, at least they're doing something. But... I mean, this this is just a nonsense, isn't it, really? I think, like, also, the article that I've read about this case, there's this tension between them saying that they have, like, deliberately hired these psychologists to make the game as addictive as possible, but they also say that the real core of the lawsuit is about the duty to inform. So they're not actually saying that they're that interested in making the game less addictive. They just think Epic should tell people how addictive it is. Yeah, so, so and, that was the comparison yeah. to the cigarettes. Thing. And maybe yeah. there is something in that, that, they should, that there should be something on boxes or a warning that comes up at the start of a game or whatever. But when it comes to... The the, the kind of case that they mentioned within this as being like the reason that they've started this but lawsuit. But what are the possible criteria for that? For what? For, for as a game addictive? Well, it, is it just like it's successful and thereby is as a function of being successful as addictive? I, I, I don't know. I guess that like, is, there must be data to suggest like how often people are playing for long spells or coming back to it. But yeah, you would effectively reach a point where almost every game would have to have something like that on it. And that comes down to, again, like the, the case that Oh. They basically want to say, they want Epic to say this video game is bad for you. That That's kind of what it feels like, because that's what they were getting, again, that's exactly the what they were getting person, at yeah. with, with the smoking thing, yeah. is that that's what they want to say. They want Epic to come out and say, this video game is bad for you, you shouldn't let your kids play it, even though they can, mm-hmm. even though it's Peggy rated such that they can, and we've designed it so that they can. Yeah. It is a bad thing and Epic are categorically not going to do that one because I don't believe that it's true and if I don't believe that it's true they definitely don't <laughs> and they have and they have the money and the power to fight it so I don't yeah. know why they wouldn't no I mean exactly that I think yeah it's, it's this isn't an issue that's going to go away anytime soon I think this idea of what what constitutes addictive gameplay um, and how do you measure that and how do you warn people about that? That's such a complex issue. The, the parents involved in this class action lawsuit basically said, if we knew it was so addictive, we wouldn't have let her ruin our child's lives or we would have monitored them more. And you think, well, if it's so addictive that it's ruining their lives, how have you not noticed that, they, that that's what's happening? Like if they're playing a game for entire days at a time, like you as parents need to notice that. And I'm not ever willing to like blame the parents for these things but there comes a point where no, no matter no, what no, warning no, is no, no, in the no. game i'm not saying like oh the, the, all the responsibility should be on the parents like this is what this is what the years and the epics were trying to yeah well it's on the parents kind of thing well and i don't believe that no i don't believe that but the parents have still got to take fucking responsibility for their kids yeah <laughs> Do you know exactly, what I mean? like, exactly it's crazy it's totally crazy to me that all right news item number two and speaking of ea uh they've managed to leak 1600 1600 lewis uh, FIFA 20 global service competitors, sorry, global series competitors information. This includes emails, date of births, EA usernames, country of residence. I mean, what? Come on. <laughs> Come on, EA. It's kind of mad. Just don't be it? a dick. Just, <laughs> how, how does this happen? I mean, they're blaming an IT mistake and it, it seems like it was shut down fairly quickly. Oh yeah, I would quickly, say it's but... a pretty big IT mistake. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would agree there. <laughs> but yeah, this is not good at all. I mean, there was even, there was like real life footballers who were caught up in this, I think, who's like actual, like their information was being displayed to other Yeah, I, I think because they, to be clear, but I think because they played the game, not because they were in the game. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> of course. Yeah, but just, just the fact that there's like, you know, a fan base there who, if they can get a hold of the email addresses and, um, at, you know, and addresses or whatever else of actual football, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. really I, not good. I, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, FIFA is one of the most popular games on the planet, yeah, right? And it's played yeah. by everyone. It doesn't matter who you are. I mean, it's it's played by the most newbie child, and the, but up to like like you were saying, like professional athletes and things like that, and people of people in very public positions that would really be very annoyed if their information <laughs> got leaked. It, it just seems as though stuff like this happens a lot. Not 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 a lot. Maybe that that's a bit unfair. But I mean, e- even back in the PS3 era, like PlayStation had a huge cyber breach. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? To the point of PSN getting shut down for a while. Yeah. Um, and then more recently with the E3 leaks and then subsequently it transpired that there had been an EA leak before that leak that we didn't even know about. Mm. And I just think that, like, where are the repercussions for this? Cyber, like, these people have an obligation to 
protect your data if you're giving it to them. Mm. They have to, because they, they do have to. I mean, it's a legal requirement. So where are the repercussions for this beyond a, a week of bad PR? I mean, if even, like, how many people are even going to pay attention to oh, this? So. I, I don't know, but in, in all seriousness, if you were, like, signed up to the, to this uh, FIFA Global Series, like, change your password. I, yeah. don't, I don't know if it's part of, uh, it, if it's part of, like, the EA login or if it's part of, like, your PlayStation account or what, is, what it is, but whatever is related to this, if, if you're a person who plays FIFA or, or particularly plays in this series, I would seriously change your password. Yeah. Like, like, don't risk it, you know, because well, a, a lot of people aren't the best with their passwords. No, and I have one password for every account everything. under the yeah. sun, which is not good password either. One. And you definitely, <laughs> definitely shouldn't do that either, ladies and gentlemen. But, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, change your password. Like, be safe because it can go really bad. Exactly. I think EA have said that they are contacting or have now contacted the people who they think were affected. But yeah, as Mark says, if you're in any way involved in this... I would just change it. I would take all precautions because who knows, it might happen again and you might be one of the unlucky ones that time. So yeah. Uh, yeah, just be careful. It just adds to the narrative that we, if you listen to last week's show, we talked about FIFA 20's launch and how like there it was, was bad. Yeah, there was a whole hashtag campaign about fixing career mode. They think, you know, fans think it's been utterly neglected. And now this, just a week later, it's really, I mean, EA's flagship franchise basically is fifa in most of the world and yeah. so they are botching it hard <laughs> <laughs> but still the highest selling game in the uk yep i mean absolutely. i mean how, how badly do you have to fuck it up that people will stop buying fifa i mean is there a fuck up so bad that people will stop buying fifa i, I think not basically because yeah. people unless yeah, this there's is a the problem it's it, the franchises like that are like so big and so bulletproof that it's just like what difference? Yeah. What, what, why? Why would a company that, particularly one like EA, who has proven time and time again to be uh, morally ambiguous, we'll say <laughs> at, uh, at the best of times, why would they give a shit? And I just don't think that they do. Nothing that they ever say makes me think that they care about anything other than the bottom line. Yeah, it's sad. All right, and news item number three: PlayStation's crossplay feature is now out of beta and available for all developers. Hurrah! However, this came with exactly no fanfare from PlayStation, <laughs> and in actual fact, it would have went largely unnoticed, I think, if it hadn't been picked up by others. <laughs> it, it seems bizarre that they wouldn't make a bigger deal of this, considering how long they've been holding out against this for all sorts of nonsense reasons. I don't think it's a coincidence that it's coming just a month or so before the release of Call of Duty Modern Warfare, which was already confirmed to have had crossplay among PC and the consoles. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on this? I know you, you, were, you were never a big cross-play guy. You never really cared much. And, and I get that because you're not a big, you're not a big online game. Neither player, am I, yeah, to exactly, be perfectly yeah. honest with you. But more people playing more games together. What's the fucking problem? <laughs> There's no problem with that. And, I, yeah, I should say, it's just, it's not that I don't think it's a good idea. I just don't have any strong feelings towards it. I suspect PlayStation didn't make a big fanfare about it only because they would be met with, like, the inevitable meme wall of people saying <laughs> how come you're so late to this you know well, perhaps true perhaps true but they were they were the most important first party to get in in place do you know what i mean mm. they, they, they have the biggest install base like in stark contrast to uh, xbox who yeah. were like all over it we're like yeah we want to cross play with everybody all the time you know what i mean yeah. it's, it's just it's very telling i think the the different approaches to this yeah uh, from playstation i wonder like other than the internal pressure from studios like epic or or sorry publishers like epic and yeah it's them putting the pressure on but like i wonder what it says about what's coming in the future you know not just next gen but next gen and next gen and next gen about where playstation fits into this kind of marketplace you know they obviously now feel like there's enough pressure from the third parties that they have to do this but i wonder what they think the pressure on them just generally as a company is if they don't start playing ball with the rest of the industry because their their dominance isn't going to last forever it's no pretty much generational so yeah and it won't it won't last forever yeah. and particularly because of a lot of the very consumer focused moves that xbox are making mm. i would be i would be pretty surprised at this point if in the west at least xbox wasn't the number one next time around or yeah. at least the launch i think it's setting up to be a lot pretty even this year like a lot more even than in years past but i think certainly in the west uh, particularly in america they, they're setting up to be pretty good launch we should also point out that we are aware that there was a uh, playstation 5 news today but we're going to cover that in topic of the week because at this moment we're just talking about the crossplay and i think that any listener who's seen probably our thumbnail for this episode will be like why aren't they talking about this <laughs> this is crazy but that's coming in topic of the week so yeah but uh yeah crossplay 
Did you see another? There was another story this week about Fortnite's cross-platform matchmaking, which is causing all sorts yeah, of the, problems. Yeah, there was some problems. Yeah, because yeah, it seems to be that, like, you know, if you are a good player on P- on mobile, say you're being paired with someone who's like not so great on PC or whatever, so you got roughly equivalent player bases. But oh, that's a fine line. To yeah, work. and it seems like Epic are being kind of taken to task for it. So I just wanted to throw that in there. I, I think a, that you just have to you just have to do it by platform almost. Like I think that if if you're playing on PC mouse and keyboard like you can only match make with other PC players playing yeah. mouse and keyboard do you know what I mean because if, if you're playing against anyone else you're an obvious total advantage. unfair advantage yeah um, again but if you're playing PC with controller then you can pair with Xbox and PlayStation and maybe Switch maybe yeah, Switch probably Switch yeah um, but I think like mobile mobile is a bit of a funny one because Again, I suppose I mean, if you I can mean, link I mean, up your controller I would say, well, I would say that someone... Well, yeah, yeah, someone on a mobile could be playing with a controller as well, that's true. But even if they were playing touchscreen... Like, I, I've watched kids play Fortnite on a tablet, touchscreen, better than I can play it with a controller, <laughs> mouse and keyboard, or just by the power of my mind. <laughs> um, it was insane how yeah. well they were. Like, so, although I might be thinking that playing on a mobile is a disadvantage in actual fact there'll be other people out there that will be like absolutely not this is yeah, my this is preferred choice yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. so yeah I think that's probably a bit of a funny one but I think the the real thing for me is just like if you're playing with mouse and keyboard like you can only match with mouse and keyboard yeah. because that is, is such a distinct advantage you know anyone else playing with like a controller yeah let them all play together what's the fucking problem all right, and news item number four, Doom Eternal loose. Doom Eternal has been delayed, boo, <laughs> boo, um, until March 2020. Id Software tweeted this statement. Throughout the development of Doom Eternal, our goal has been to deliver a game that exceeds your greatest expectations across the board. To make sure we're delivering the best experience for Doom Eternal to live up to our standards of speed and polish, we've made the decision to extend our launch date by a few months to March 20, 2020. <laughs> we know many fans will be disappointed by this delay, but we are confident that Doom Eternal will deliver a gaming experience that is worth the wait. In addition to shifting the Doom Eternal launch date, we've made a couple of other changes we wanted you to know about. Invasion mode, which will allow you to enter another player's game as a playable demon, will release as a free update shortly after launch. Doom Eternal for Nintendo Switch will release after the other platforms. We will announce that date in the future. And Doom 64 will be available on Xbox One, PlayStation 4 and PC in addition to Nintendo Switch. We are adding Doom 64 as a pre-order bonus for Doom Eternal on all platforms so you'll be able to download and play this classic game for free just for pre-ordering Doom Eternal. Doom 64 will be released on March 20, 2020 on all platforms. We're grateful to every Doom fan for your dedication and support. We can't wait to rip and tear right alongside you extended their launch date quotes <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting way of saying delay isn't it um yeah i mean look what would you rather do would you rather have a not so polished possibly bad game mm. sooner or would you rather have a good game later i mean to me that's what this comes down to well yeah exactly and if it means that the team doesn't have to crunch on their Absolutely. way to getting yeah, out in 100%, october 100%. like there's there should be no real issue for players that this game has been delayed there's so much coming out in october and november and december that like you don't need this game right now well Lewis, there's also quite a lot coming out in march 2020 <laughs> if you hadn't noticed that is true so what they've done is moved it from an incredibly busy window in 2019 <laughs> to possibly an even busier window yeah. in 2020 so maybe that shows but, that they're confident i mean yeah bethesda obviously think this game can hang so <laughs> yeah i mean what do you make of this apart from that you just i think it's like i think it's fine as you say it's good if it's good for the team and if it's good for the game then it's the right thing i think it's a nice statement to put out just like updating on those other modes and releases as well getting doom 64 as a pre-order bonus you know i would be slightly skeptical of pre-ordering you know this game and other games generally but um if you really what, you, a bethesda game never well exactly <laughs> exactly um so you know if but if you're up for playing doom 64 being able to play a game with 64 in the title on playstation or xbox is pretty fun yeah yeah, yeah that's cool. that's <laughs> so yeah but, but as i understood it from a previous nintendo direct mm-hmm. that doom 64 is also coming out as like a standalone title that you can just buy P- uh, potentially yeah i'm not sure they, they showed it off that, 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 that could be wrong ladies and gentlemen yeah. but i think that i thought that they were at least that that's off. how it seemed at that point maybe the plan has changed with this delay but uh, perhaps it has perhaps it has interesting that they're saying that the switch date is after the rest of the consoles i suppose you kind of expect that mm. but yeah it'd be probably good to know that date before anyone commits to it on another platform if well, they exactly, did want to play yeah. on switch not that i'm suggesting that that would be the the natural place <laughs> yeah the, the natural place or even the correct place i would go so far as to say <laughs> is to play doom 64 but i mean people like the portability so yeah you, know. you seemed really excited for this when we first Man, saw I th- it that's because the e3 trailer looked absolutely fucking ridiculous yeah. it looked so so good and i definitely want to go back and play 
the or I want to go back and play Doom 2016 uh, before I played this one. But as it was coming out, or so I thought quite soon, I never thought that that was going to happen. But perhaps I have more of a chance now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and just finishing off with a couple of shout outs. Red Dead Redemption 2 Lewis is finally coming to PC. Hurrah! I hear from the PC Master Race. It's coming out on November the 5th on Rockstar's PC launcher, the Epic Games Store, Green Man Gaming, Humble Store, GameStop, and Stadia. Notice yeah, I didn't say Steam there, Lewis, but it is coming out in the December, so about a month later. Yeah. So if you waited this long for it to be on Steam, I'm sure you can wait that extra month. <laughs> Yeah, good for good for the PC gamers out there. It was an absolutely superb game. Absolutely, I, I yeah. would have said. Um, I'm sure it would look absolutely <laughs> stunning, absolutely stunning on a PC. Yeah, it'll be amazing to see what the mod community can do with this game. On oh, PC that's true as well. well. That's I mean, so I think that well, there's been rumbles about there being an undead nightmares too. Yep, as yeah. well. But I think that if there's not, someone's going to mod that in like <laughs> two seconds. The, the mod community with Rockstar Games in general, but. Uh, particularly the gta games has been historically awesome yeah so do you know the first red dead never came to pc absolutely yeah yeah at all i was shocked to hear that it just seems like such a like a perfect game for pc it's it's also just like a very iconic and important game now that you think oh yeah i know someone would have done it yeah yeah. it seems it seems pretty bizarre but pc folk your wait is over red dead is coming to you and make sure you check it out because it is absolutely awesome all right, shout out number two. Mario Kart Tour is Nintendo's most downloaded smartphone game at launch, and by a distance so grand, it is unbelievable. So it's been downloaded 90.1 million times. The next closest is Animal Crossing Pocket Camp at 14.3 million. That is a colossal distance, and in actual fact, the graph that I'm looking at here, which is in a Eurogamer article, all the articles that we use will be in the show notes, as ever, at players2.com, but they've got they've got a great little graph in here that shows Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, Super Mario Run, Fire Emblem Three Houses, Dr. Mario World, and Dragalia Lost, and if you add all of them together, it doesn't even come to half, it doesn't even come to half the amount of downloads that uh, Mario Kart Tour got. That is absolutely wild. <laughs> Mario Kart is obviously just an enormous brand that people Of course love, it is, of so. course it is, but I didn't realise it was that much. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, Super Mario runs there, you know what I mean? Yeah. I just wonder how many people are out there who play mobile games like on their commute or whatever, and they also used to play Mario Kart when they were kids. I mean, it's hard to believe that you would be a gamer and you've not stumbled across Mario Kart yeah, at some point, exactly, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's an absolutely colossal number. It's also third in revenue all time already for Nintendo only behind Super Mario Run as we just said and Fire Emblem Heroes that's got 28.2 million and Super Mario Run had 16.1 and Mario Kart Tour has already got 12.7 so I mean that is going to get eaten up in no time in a week in a yeah. week particularly with their quite odd financing model for uh, Mario Kart yeah, yeah. It, it really doesn't seem good to no be it's got I, I don't like it at all both microtransactions and the subscription model working yeah like codependently but also it seems to be trying to trick maybe the more casual gamers into believing that they're playing against other people Um, online because above it's got like fake usernames it's got like fake usernames above the other carts on the track but you're not playing online and it just seems like Mm. i mean that seems like quite insidious and i don't like that at all i'm actually quite annoyed that this has done so well because of how bad the microtransactions are in it and i know how bad that they are and i'm even more disappointed to be one of those 90 million people Uh, (laughs) (laughs) and i'm definitely going to play it at some point yes i know i'm a hypocrite right let's move on all right, and shout out three. The Fallout Legacy Collection list has leaked on uh, German Amazon, and apparently it's only coming out in Europe, but the games that it has is Fallout, the original Fallout, Fallout 2, Fallout Tactics, Fallout 3 Game of the Year Edition, Fallout New Vegas Ultimate Edition, Fallout 4 Game of the Year Edition. It's I mean, crazy. <laughs> that is that is quite a collection. That yeah. is a lot of hours of gaming there. I have noticed that Fallout 76 isn't there, and that's probably a good... That's probably good. Um, <laughs> not part of the legacy. Not then. part of the legacy. <laughs> <laughs> um, apparently, this is going to cost uh, about 40 euros, which is roughly about 35 quid. It's probably it's 40 quid now. Well, yeah, it's probably 40 quid now, yeah. But let's hope that it's not quite that much. Yeah. Because I'm probably going to buy it. But I mean, 40 quid, like that's... 40 quid for all those games is... I mean, you're getting a hell of a lot of games though. That's crazy, really. Yeah, I mean, as much as you could find some of those for quite cheap, you know, to get the two original Fallout games, I can't imagine it's super easy at the moment. No, no, no. Actually, you can you can get them on Steam for like bucks. Okay, yeah, yeah they're yeah, on yeah. Steam, yeah, yeah. In fact, and in fact, 
I know that Bethesda were actually giving them away because of the Fallout 76 debacle. Mm-hmm. So they were actually giving them away for free uh, for a lot of okay. <laughs> so in actual fact, as someone, as someone who uh, played Fallout 76 in or around launch, mm-hmm. I'm actually eligible to get those three games for free. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. No, well, you probably don't need this then. Well, it's also. I, I mean, I'm t- I mean, they aren't the reason I'm buying it. No, it's no, definitely no. Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas, which are both absolutely yeah. incredible. But it is only on PC. Like, that's what's been confirmed so far. So It's only on PC? At, at the moment, at ah, least. It's so, fine. Yeah. Work out somehow. But the, I think the interesting thing about this story, though, is that it's coming to at least to Britain and Germany on October 25th, which is. By the way, there's no way that this stays as a European no, sh- exclusive. Surely one. not. If, surely. if you're an American person, you'll get it soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but October 25th is the same day that The Outer Worlds is coming out yes which by, it, uh, from Obsidian from who Obsidian previously who, made some of the Fallout games yeah they made Fallout New Vegas and two of the original designers on Fallout and Fallout 2 are also part of Obsidian and part of the team making The Outer Worlds so it's a bit feels a little bit cheeky to launch it on that it's day, a bit cheeky <laughs> it's a little bit cheeky obviously they know that their name is going to be in the zeitgeist yeah. there they know that it's going to be a good good, a good time to launch I mean it's a bit dickish I think yeah. but I, I think that as good as their legacy collection is, I think that their worlds is going to be it's going to be overshadowing it. Yeah. <laughs> as it, it looks, should, yeah, as it should because it looks absolutely great. All right, Lewis, time for a beer, and we'll come back with topic of the week and the PS Five. Woo! <laughs> and we are back with topic of the week. Topic of the week this week is the fact that PS Five has been confirmed. Lewis, it's been confirmed, and it will be coming out in late twenty twenty. I don't. I say confirmed as if it was ever in a moment so. <laughs> Um But it's also been confirmed that it is in fact called the PlayStation 5, which again, I don't really think was in much doubt. No. I mean, there was a small part of me that could see it being like the PlayStation Elysium or something like that. <laughs> like just some absolute nonsense name, but I'm kind of glad that it's just called yeah. the PS5. <laughs> Five such a solid number, man. you got to use that. Yeah, so the story was broken by Wired just this very day yeah just earlier today so it was a, a chap called peter rubin uh, on wired which you can go and read the whole article you should if you're interested in this but kotaku did a really nice summary of it as well so we'll be kind of taking bits and pieces from that and yeah. um, also jim ryan the ceo and president of sony interactive entertainment posted a blog post on the playstation blog so this is this isn't a leak this this is a full proper confirmation and announcement yep. from a sony proper confirmation and it seems to have come about because there's like dev kits starting to be sent out and you know different parameters referrals and stuff like that going out to people so i think they're just cut basically nipping the idea of leaks in the bud um so some interesting stuff to talk about beyond the name and the the launch date in holiday 2020 both of which were fair, i mean we, we kind of knew you know <laughs> um just some quick things the console will have a solid state drive rather than a physical hard drive yeah which i think we also kind of knew as well it from sort of needs to be that. statements yeah. um which means that uh, you'll still have physical discs um but there'll be 100 gigabyte discs and you can choose this is one of the interesting innovations that the solid state drive uh, permits you can choose what to install from your game and yes and what I, to deinstall as yes well. yes so, that'd be, so you could have only the multiplayer for example or only the campaign exactly from like a, like certain games yes yeah, or so you can rather than at the moment having to install a huge file like thinking about red dead 2 which was like nearly 100 gigabytes alone yeah, yeah, yeah. um and i had to clear out half my system just to get it onto the old ps4 og like this means that you will be able to like, as you say you can install the the single player campaign and then deinstall the single player campaign once you've beaten it and then upload the multiplayer and so you can have much more kind of oh that's cool i never i never really thought about that that's pretty cool so you could actually install like both like thinking about a call of duty or something Mm -hmm. like that you could install the whole thing play through the campaign done with that uninstalled but you've still got the multiplayer there uh, absolutely that's good actually yeah i, I quite like that's that that's nice nice touch there yeah, nice touch um, and that um optical drive for taking those discs is also going to double as a 4k blu-ray player so that is going to really help with ps5 sales to the general public as well i suspect in the same way that ps2 and the kind of dvd uptake yeah yeah definitely i mean as much as the price of the ps3 was laughed at at mm. the time and, and it was ridiculously expensive to be completely fair mm-hmm. but it was still the cheapest dvd the, the cheapest <laughs> yeah. blu-ray player that you could buy i remember that at the time because the, the next closest one that i could find on amazon at the time because i checked because i'm a loser <laughs> um was a grand yeah, yeah. jesus wow <laughs> i know imagine that imagine a blu-ray player being a grand <laughs> That's mad, um one of the other things that they briefly touch on is a new um ui for the kind of home screen of ps5 thank you jesus yeah, because the Thank current you, one is pretty this, bad. This is so needed. <laughs> yes, um, but one like the interesting thing that they were saying about that is that it will show you things that you can actually do in your games rather than just are your mates playing it and what trophies are available or whatever. Yeah, so I actually read this so that I never got managed to have the time due to my ridiculous work <laughs> schedule to to read the full Wired article. But so I'm just kind of working off the 
the Kotaku breakdown, which which is really good. And I again we'll put uh, yeah. links in the show notes over at players dot com. But I never really understood this. Like what what do they mean by so that? So it will be things like the, the examples they give is that for a multiplayer game, it will tell you actually what, uh, sorry, what matches you can jump into at that very point. So I guess which of your friends or party members or whatever are online, what modes they're playing, what modes have lobbies kind of going at that point or whatever. I don't know enough about multiplayer to know all the ins and outs of that. <laughs> um, but the other, they said about like single player campaigns uh, or single player games, it will tell you like what missions are available and like, so the way I was imagining So is that it, part of your safe state then? Will it just know that? I from, guess it'll just know it all, yeah. Uh, so Oh, right. That's interesting. I'm thinking about like when we were just playing control there. So if you loaded this up on PS5, you might be able to hover over that and it will say like you've got these two bureau alerts that are the kind of like generative things within the game that you yeah, can yeah, go yeah. do, or you've got this main mission and these two side quests, and maybe tells you like where you need to go for those or what uh, trophies or what whatever you okay. can unlock out of that. Okay, it's a minor, I'm less interested in that. That's a bit superfluous. It's, it's, I mean, it's like it's a minor there for people thing. To want to, yeah, which is cool. I think okay. it's a minor thing, but the idea being, I guess, particularly with this idea that you can uninstall and, and reinstall different parts of your games that you can quite quickly go across your library and just be like, what do I feel like doing just now? Oh, actually, I've got a wee bit of like map clear. I can do an Assassin's Creed Odyssey or I can jump in here and play an online game of FIFA right now yeah, just stuff fair, like that fair, fair enough fair enough man fair enough that's cool it was that, a pretty, pretty cool. minor part of it all but I'm sure we'll hear more but the main thing the absolute key thing about this announcement is the new controller this is yeah, really yeah, yeah. what they're leaning into so it hasn't been named yet but it's almost certainly going to be called DualShock 5 so maybe <laughs> it's just it refer to it why as that wouldn't for it be now um, so the, the Peter Rubin at Wired um, held it and got a shot of it basically said it feels a bit heavier than the DualShock for but otherwise kind but of sim- feels, but similar but feels similar, similar otherwise yeah like, exactly yeah. which is good I, yeah i was just saying to you off air there that i actually quite like i quite enjoy the holding a playstation 4 controller versus an xbox controller i know that people's minds have just been blown there because i know a lot of people absolutely love that xbox controller and i mean each to their own if that's what you prefer totally cool no bro- no arguments from me but i just really like it above anything else it's just what i'm used to yeah but i, I just find that it, it just sits good in my hand so if, if they're sticking with that kind of general shape with maybe a wee bit few updates here and there quite happy to yeah with well exactly shape yeah. wise yeah. Don't, don't change a design classic as well you know like it's, the joke has been fairly similar through all generations so um, but well, the, it's identical for three of them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the key thing about this new controller are two key things one is it's new they're, they're replacing the old motor rumble feedback with a new haptic feedback system yes which I'm just going to read you a section this of this cool. article because it gives you a real sense of what this can do so uh, the the writer was able to play some demos made by Japan Studio, who made Astrobot. He said, In the most impressive, I ran a character through a platform level featuring a number of different surfaces, all of which gave distinct and surprisingly immersive tactile experiences. Sand felt slow and sloggy. Mud felt slow and soggy. On ice, a high-frequency response made the thumbsticks really feel like my character was gliding. Jumping into a pool, I got a sense of the resistance of the water on a wooden bridge, a bouncy sensation. That's I can, fucking cool, man. I can man. barely understand <laughs> how cool. that will feel about I don't know either, <laughs> but I'm excited to find out. Yeah, <laughs> that that sounds awesome. He though. talks about playing a kind of a version of Gran Turismo Sport as well, which apparently the base game, the original game, doesn't have any real kind of feedback on it, um, because getting the different textures was just way too much for current gen. But on this, he says, if you drive with like one wheel on the tarmac and one wheel like in the dirt or on the grass on the side of a track, you can feel both of those things at once. Shut which, up. What, that's what it says. That? That's what it says. I have no idea, man. That but. sounds like witchcraft. <laughs> that's insane. And then the other other really interesting thing about this controller is it has these things called adaptive triggers which yeah so this was cool as well which is basically a tool that will allow developers to program certain kind of feedback into games and the example they use basically is that it means your triggers will start to feel differently depending on what you're using in the game so if you are drawing a bow and arrow that will feel like it's got the you know the tug and tautness of a bow and arrow so it'll be slightly it'll take slightly more pressure perhaps to push in your trigger i guess so yeah or or you'll reach a point where it's essentially like fully taught and you can't pull it in anymore i guess it also mentions like the feeling of using uh you know an assault rifle versus a shotgun you will be able to feel that in the trigger feedback which again is quite hard to understand and i i I don't fully understand that either but what you're saying is that the developers could program mm -hmm. for that in the controller God, man, that's mind blowing. So the, that, that's cool. That, sus- that's really cool stuff, man. I suspect the thing, like the caveat to that, is like these controllers. I think are part of these dev kits that are first, that are now being sent out for the first time. And so I imagine a lot of launch games will not do very much with this kind of thing because it probably won't really have been 
developed well enough. Well, I don't point. know. Like, if you're launching a new system, you want your launch titles to show off that new yeah. system. So I, I reckon that... So, for example, one of the games that's kind of been banded about is quite likely to be a launch title for the PS5 is, like, Horizon Zero Dawn. Mm-hmm. Bow and Arrows are a big part of that. Yeah. But kind of different Bow and Arrows as well. <laughs> like, so I'd, I'd be interested to see if pulling the trigger on that to, to pull Aloy's bow mm-hmm. or to, like, say, in God of War 2, mm-hmm. like, to throw the Leviathan axe, like, how different that feels on yeah. the trigger. That that'd be, that'd be just that'd really be exciting, exciting, man. Yeah. I, well, that, you, that's really cool. You've like, got like, to imagine first I don't know, like, I'm a mad nerd for stuff like this. Like, <laughs> I love that shit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd imagine first party titles will be pretty quick on the uptake but third third parties maybe it'll take a bit longer yeah, to get so. there i mean i've actually been more and more looking into kind of controllers and i was considering getting like a kind of better controller but we're a bit too kind of late in the generation mm-hmm. now so it's sort of pointless but the ability to be able to change a controller as well is quite exciting mm-hmm. so like mm-hmm. if you could go into the settings say and if you're playing like call of duty and you want your trigger to be like an absolute hair trigger like you want absolutely the least amount of lag possible on that or like some other twitch shooter you know mm-hmm that's what you want and if you could change that in your sentence such that your your trigger was like you barely had to touch it before it started shooting then that's that's pretty cool to me you yeah know what i mean because I, I was looking at a scuff controller that cost like 180 quid or something wow. like that that did that <laughs> which brings me on to something that i was thinking about and that i just said to you off air is that see if this controller has got all that technology in it that is 100 quid if you want another controller that sounds to me like that's going to be 100 quid yeah which also makes me think that that will be an elite controller Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That will not be a standard controller. I think you will get a standard DualShock, and what we are talking about right now will be some sort of equivalent to Xbox's Elite controller, potentially. Know, yeah. Which PlayStation don't really have just now. Yeah, I don't imagine they would foreground it in this way if it wasn't going to come in the box, though. So it might be that you do get one, but like you say, that they might be super expensive for additional controllers, mm. or you might be able to get you know versions of it without some of this stuff like they did say that the particularly the haptic feedback thing has been in development since the DualShock 4 was in development and they were in a position to put that out on the PS4 Pro but chose not to because it would divide gamers basically if depending on what system you had so like mm. it, it might be that they've been able mm. to get the cost sure of it down buying that. well I, I know maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but yeah it's, it's an interesting thing to think like what impact will these things have on the price of the system because there's obviously quite a lot of high end I mean, that's not to say anything about like the, the ray tracing and stuff like that that's already been confirmed for it. Um, yeah, absolutely. They also yeah. said... Uh, It'll support ray tracing and 8K. That, yeah. That's correct, yeah. And the ray tracing they've now confirmed as well is not it's not done at a software level like it is in, built into the hardware of the system, which apparently I don't know anything about. No, I don't know anything about. But no, no, I know that you have to issue. have you have to have a graphics card that's like ray capable. Like, capable. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there is a hardware element to it. Mm-hmm. I, I understand that, but also there's obviously a lot going on in the background yeah. of the software to be able to pull it's that. It just off. seemed like there had been like some concern among gamers that it was going to be. I assume like some sort of trick done at software level rather than an actually like advanced graphics cards, but they've Mark Cerny has confirmed that it will be that, cool. which is amazing. That's good. No, that's great. Absolutely. One of the other announcements within this article um, is just just confirmation that Bluepoint Games is developing for PS5. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about this. Yeah, man. that is exciting. So they don't that say stuff. very much. Uh, Bluepoint Games, obviously, being the studio who remade Shadow of the Colossus um, last year, was that twenty eighteen or end yeah, of twenty seventeen? So, something yeah. like that. So they we've been talking for ages on and off the air about what on earth they might be doing next and all they're saying at the moment is that they are working on a big one but he uh, this is the president of uh, Bluepoint Games Marco Thrush was talking about being really excited by the SSD drive that the system's going to have because essentially it means you're getting back to something closer to like cartridge instant loading because you don't yeah, yeah. He, he said like you, we won't have to slow you down by putting you behind doors or on elevators and all that kind of stuff yeah, to load next the bits. classic elevator yeah exactly yeah. Um, and also Laura Mule from EA was talking about how machine learning will be more capable and more kind of powerful yeah. with this well that's thing, what so. they're getting in the, the or the Microsoft shall I say uh, like Azure stuff like mm-hmm. I know that they're like big into machine learning and so it's not just cloud processing that they do they, they also do a lot of machine learning who obviously play PlayStation are now, or Sony, sorry, is Sony and Microsoft. It's much, much higher level than Xbox and PlayStation, but they're now involved with that as well. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see the kind of fruits of that. Exactly, well, I yeah. yeah. So, I mean, with this kind of tech and, yeah, like you just mentioned, like the potential of cloud gaming, streaming games. Still not mentioned it, though. They haven't mentioned it specifically, no. Which is beginning to worry me. I, I think we're, st- I mean, we're still basically a year out from this by all accounts like if it's we, we are we are but do you know what we're only months out from xcloud and stadia 
mm. and PlayStation have no answer to that. That's true, yeah. Apart and from their superior games catalog. <laughs> apart from their superior <laughs> games catalog, one would argue <laughs> if they were right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously, look, the, the, the PlayStation first parties, it goes without saying, they're, they're fucking incredible. Mm-hmm. As, as far as AAA first parties go, apart from Nintendo, which are doing their own mad Nintendo thing, they're the next best, yeah. as, as far as I'm concerned. Almost without, almost without question. Uh, however, it's getting to the point where, yeah, you you can rely on that, but only for so long. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, we, we need to be pushing these services. We need to be at the same level as Xbox and, well, Stadia, potentially. And I really think that cloud gaming is going to be becoming more and more and more and more important as the next generation goes on. Forget about the launch, right? You, even if you knock it out of the park at launch, as we move one year down the line, two years down the line, three years down the line, the cloud gaming thing is going to become so much more important. Mm-hmm. And I feel as if PlayStation just aren't in a position to compete with that, with Xbox or, uh, well, with Microsoft or Google. And I'm not really sure they ever will be. No, I'm not sure either. Like, they don't have the infrastructure. They're essentially borrowing Microsoft. The the way that they're going in quite hard. I actually saw advertising in the train station that I go through today for PlayStation Now. Like, they are going hard on that cut that we got last week, which doesn't doesn't suggest, though, that we're about to get, get, like, a proper Game Pass competitor, you know, because I don't think that they would be leaning so hard into PlayStation Now. Mm. So you're totally right. There are things about PlayStation strategy at the moment. From a PlayStation fanboy point of view, I really hope that that's just that they're marketing cycle is such that in the next 12 months they're going to at some point go we are going to have this cloud gaming system we're going to have this uh subscription model we're you know and kind of start to i mean imagine a whole year of just constant announcements like that building up towards the release of this thing it'll be incredible and i think that that might put them back in contention but if they can't build those systems then yeah i I really think that there's there's very few that are capable of doing cloud gaming Mm -hmm. we know that google's capable of doing it because they are we know that Microsoft's capable of doing it because they are. Facebook are probably capable of doing it, but they won't. Mm-hmm. Amazon are definitely capable of doing it, but I don't think they are really interested. Mm. And then, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a very large... I think it might be some sort of subsidiary of Tencent, actually, that are oh, kind, like of, kind of... Weibo based, is... Uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's so all that and like WeChat and stuff mm-hmm. like that that they have over there, like what whatever that is. Yeah. I can't remember what that's called. <laughs> uh, but I know that they, they are probably more than capable yeah. of doing this as well. So I'm kind of thinking, do we see a day where the PlayStation branch of Sony is perhaps just bought by one of these people? Bigger. Wow. I know, I know. It's, it's, it's actually a horrible thought because I, I wouldn't want yeah. any of those people to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more likely they'll just start cutting deals for kind of infrastructure, but... Who knows? I don't know. Well, like you said, we're, they've already got something in place with uh, Microsoft already. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully they can build a system on top of that exactly, for, yeah. for PlayStation. But uh, we don't know as of yet. And standing here right now, we have heard nothing from them suggesting that they are in any way, right now at least, interested in doing cloud gaming. No. And we also know sitting here right now that before the end of the year, we're going to get to see xCloud and Stadia in action. Yeah. So... Maybe it all comes down it to feels, how successful they it are. It feels a little behind. Yeah, it do, be they absolutely do. But I think given the comparison between these kind of announcements like we got today and what we got about Project Scarlet um, from Xbox a few months back, nothing about that announcement per- was particularly exciting. It all seemed like more or less the same information that Sony had already put out about PlayStation 5 yeah. next gen at that point. And, and some people were saying actually that the PlayStation hardware sounded as if it could have been slightly better, as yeah. well, which is almost unprecedented yeah. for... Uh, xbox versus playstation like they've microsoft have always kind of doubled down on like the hardware mm-hmm. you know but yeah interesting times Lewis. exciting interesting times, times. Yeah. Do, exciting times do yeah. you think that you mentioned uh, horizon zero dawn there do you think that this confirmation of a late 2020 release date confirms that ghost of tsushima will be like a crossover launch title i i'm slightly concerned about that game now i've not heard about it in a long time i thought that the trailer that they showed not e3 there obviously because mm-hmm. they weren't there but e3 in 2018 was absolutely jaw-droppingly stunning yeah to the point that i was like i didn't even know playstation pro let alone an og playstation was capable of that and i kind of wonder are they tarting this up for the ps5 I, I, you know? I think so basically i mean if you've got a game that already looks that good on whatever they were running on at that point and you're gonna get a you're gonna get a system that has ray tracing support I, you know they'd be daft not to do that and just looking at the release cycles over the last couple of years you know they usually have their kind of spring game which we now know is going to be the last of us last mm-hmm. year they, yep, yep. or well, this year they released oh um, so it's a wee bit earlier this year it's february right? 
Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's true. Um, so there's a, I guess there's a potential that Ghost of Tsushima gets announced fairly soon. I, I, th- I suspect. I not think now. Ghost of Tsushima probably July. You think so? You think next yeah? Summer? Yeah, I'd say July. Because you need to remember, like, although it will be available on both, as will Last of Us, as will Death Stranding, mm. but when it comes around to launching the game, they want to be launching with fresh titles, you know what I mean? Are they going to hold off Ghost of Tsushima to be one of those fresh titles? Maybe, but it leaves a big gap in the middle of the year. Yeah, there, you know? it does do that. But I guess if they're filling that gap with, like, announcements about PS5 and just keeping the kind of bus yeah, going maybe. potential. Definitely. I just I love the idea of a launch lineup that's, like, a slightly kind of upgraded version of The Last of Us 2 and Death Stranding plus like a new Horizon Zero Dawn game and Ghost of Tsushima like yeah, that would I mean, be an incredible I mean, yeah, launch just drop, <laughs> just drop those first parties yeah. you know just yeah. drop them heavy alright ladies and gentlemen I think we'll call it a day there you can follow Players 2 on all the social media that's Facebook Twitter YouTube Instagram the lot you can find our written content over at players2.com that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S T O dot com and if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts, that really, really helps us out. If you like anything that you've heard here, please just take that five seconds to go and give us five stars. Again, there's a reason that every podcast that you listen to asks you to do this. It really does help, and it really does a huge amount for the exposure. And if you are one of these amazing people who have done this for us, just thank you so much. We really appreciate you going out of your way to do that. And I would just like to remind everyone that our game for this month is Gorogoa. It is a superb little puzzle game, and I really, really hope that you can... Get, give it a chance because it's an odd one it's an odd one <laughs> again i would highly recommend that you play it on ios or android but it is available on all platforms all right ladies and gentlemen see you later thanks, thanks.